Good evening. Uh, we're calling the regular meeting of the Belfast City Council uh, to order on Monday, June 24, 2019 at 7.03 p.m. Back to open session. We are reconvening from the closed session and there are no reportable action taken at the closed session. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hamada. Here. Councilmember Coops. Here. Mayor Potem Garza. Here. Councilmember Dutton. Here. Mayor Santanez. Here. Uh, tonight's invocation will be led by Councilmember Ray Dunn, and then the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by uh, P.J. Milana, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, please rise. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for all your guidance that you give us. Thank you for having faith in our decisions. Thank you for the outcome that always show favor in your eyes. Let all the residents of Bellflower understand what you do here to make Bellflower a better community. Let us uh, lay out the, the uh, form in which this city progresses into the future for all the betterment of every resident in this town. And last, uh, Heavenly Father, Let's uh, watch over our military, and, uh, police, and firemen, and all first responders. Always be there for us. In Lord's name, amen. 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 Please, Please place, place your right, right, right hand over your heart and join with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, PJ. Uh, City Council announcement, let me start um, by saying that um, the first Summer Street Fest event will take place this Thursday, June 27, in downtown Bellflower, on Bellflower Boulevard between Flower and Oak Street. Please join us for a night of good food, great music, and exciting family fun. The event begins at 6.30 p.m. and will provide family fun until 9.30 p.m. Entrance is free. Remember to bring your own lawn chair. No alcohol will be permitted. It's a great event uh, in downtown Belfar. I hope you will join us. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way for our community to get together. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Juan Garza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Cool off on a hot summer night with a dive-in movie. This Friday, June 28th, the first summer dive-in movie will be taking place at the Bellflower Aquatic Center from 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. There is a $5 uh, fee per person. The movie showing this Friday night is How to Train Your Dragon. No outside flotation devices are allowed except for Coast Guard approved life jackets. To pre-register or if you have any questions, please call the Aquatic Center at 562 866-2015. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Protem Garza. Uh, Council Member Ray Dunn. Thank you, Mayor. Steelcraft Bellflower is now officially open to the public. Come out and enjoy all nine vendors and what they have to offer, along with enjoying live music and community events. Steelcraft is a dog and family friendly venue. It is located on the corner of Bellflower Boulevard and Oak Street. To learn more about the vendors or the hours and also the calendar of events that's uh, waiting in line, please visit the website at www.steelcraftlb.com. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ray. Council Member Dan Coots. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As Independence Day is around the corner, the City of Bellflower encourages all residents to have fun and a safe, and responsible manner. If you will be celebrating with the fireworks by law, they must bear the name Safe and Sane on the label, and the seal must say State of California State Fire Marshal. Fireworks not sold at community sale booths are almost always illegal and will result in a $2,000 penalty for use or possession. It was $1,000 last year. We went to $2,000 this year. If you sus suspect or observe someone storing illegal fireworks, contact the Bellfire substation 
at 562 area code 925-0124. If you observe someone discharging illegal fireworks, call the Lakewood Sheriff Station at 562-623-3500. You may choose to remain anonymous if you'd like. For more information about neighbor, neighboring fireworks shows or activities, you can visit the city's website at www.bellflower.org, or of course you can always call City Hall 562-804-1424, extension 2249. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Council Member Raymond Hamada. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm gonna say that City Hall will be closed on Thursday, July 4th, uh, and uh, that'll be in, in observance of, of Independence Day. And the offices will reopen on Friday, July 5th from 8 to 4.30 p.m. So uh, we all wish everyone a fun and safe holiday and just wanted to reiterate Mr. Coop's comments again, fines for the illegal fireworks. So, all right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Raymond. Um, tonight we have one uh, um, certificate of appreciation to be presented to Deputy District Attorney Georgina Ruiz. I'd like to invite my fellow council members to the riser for the presentation. Uh, well, when I saw this uh, on the agenda tonight, I was I was kind of shocked um, because I didn't I didn't understand where she was going. Why are we presenting this certificate to Georgina? Please come forward here. Uh, so, so the more I asked, uh, and I learned that um, she is moving on. She's going to be reassigned. She's not retiring because I'm surprised if she's retiring. She's too young to retire. So she is retiring. Uh, she is uh, being reassigned. So she's leaving the city of Bellflower. But let me just share with you that uh, Georgina did a lot of work for the city of Bellflower. I think I can honestly tell you that um, she's one of the persons that I considered who made a big difference for the city of Bellflower. She works with the, uh, with the city staff, she works with the sheriff's department to enforce the law, to basically rid of a lot of lawless criminals from the city. And um, she's one of those persons that uh, she kind of uh, spoke softly but carried the big stick. And I will say big, it's really, it's a huge stick. And when they, when they get the wrath of Georgina, uh, they basically go to jail. She worked with a lot of the apartment owners to rid of those um, gang members that are living in those apartments. And uh, so I would say that, um, I can honestly say that the city of Bellflower is much better because of her work in the city of Bellflower. So with that, I'd like to appreciate um, and extend our uh, gratitude to Georgina for all the work that she did for the city. And uh, in recognition of that service, we'd like to present her this uh, certificate of achievement presented to Georgina Ruiz for exceptional leadership and service as Deputy District Attorney. Your outstanding contributions exemplify commitment and service to the community that the Bellflower is proud to support. Signed by Mayor Sunny R. Santa Ines, Mayor Claude M. Juan Garza, Mayor, uh, uh, Council Member Ray Danton, Council Member Raymond Hamada, and Council Member Dan Coops. So, Georgina, on behalf of the City Council and the grateful citizens and residents of Bellflower, thank you so much for all you did for the city. Well, I want to thank the council, the mayor. Um, actually, time flies when you're having fun. Believe it or not, it has been 11 years since I've been in the city of Bellflower, and I'm very proud that I've had tremendous support from the council, and particularly all the assistance from law enforcement officers. And I'm very proud to say that I have gained a great awareness of the significant work that our law enforcement officers do out in the field, and they don't get as much credit as they deserve. Every single uh, nuisance case, everyone wants law enforcement officers to resolve it. And what I have taught citizens and property owners and myself, I have learned that working collaboratively with everyone involved, the citizens, neighbors, or nonprofit organizations, the church groups, by all working together, 
we have been very, very effective. And uh, like I mentioned, it's never been a, there's never been a dull moment here in the city of Bellflower. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. And one more thing, I wanted to thank my husband, Dr. T, for putting up with me during all these years. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Okay, we now have public comments. Mr. Stewart. This is the time set aside for the public to address the City Council on matters not listed on the agenda. Anyone wishing to address the City Council should come to the podium and be recognized by the Mayor and state your name for the record. If you wish to address the City Council on an agenda item, you may do so by approaching the podium as we review that particular item. You will be given a reasonable amount of time to, to address the City Council. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. My name Good evening, is Josh. Thank you. My name is Josh Murray. I'm here on behalf of Clifton and Brackenseek Library, 9945 Flower Street. I'm very, very happy to um, announce that this year, LA County Library is the Library of the Year for Library Journal. Um, and in celebration of this um, prestigious honor on Wednesday, June 26th, this upcoming Wednesday, from 6 to 7 p.m., we're going to be having a folks, we have a winner, paint and sip celebration. Join us for a relaxing evening of painting as we celebrate LA County Library's recent win of the 2019 Library of the Year Award. Refreshments will be provided for this family-friendly event. A list of ingredients will be available at the program. And all ages are welcome. This program is sponsored by the Friends of the Bellflower Library. I'm gonna leave some of these flyers here for the audience members, um, but I hope that as many people in town can attend as possible. Thank you. All right, thank you, Josh. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, my name is Jeanette Gosden, and I'm a resident, longtime resident of the city of Bellflower. And I live on Cerritos Avenue, which seems to be a racetrack of uh, anywhere between 70 and 90 miles an hour. Um, after dark, of course. There's three stop signs that are totally ignored between Somerset and a Rose, uh, Rose Grant. And it's a quick trip to cut across from Lakewood Boulevard down to Clark. But that's not what it's being used for. Uh, it's being used to see who can go the fastest and see how many donuts you can put in the intersections. Uh, we had a lot of close calls. We found a lot of dead animals. Uh, fortunately, I'm unaware of anybody that's been actually hit by a car, but that's a miracle. I'm asking the city council, what are we doing right now? I know there's some things in the works, but um, Cerritos Avenue certainly should be one of the streets in consideration for speed bumps of some sort. Um, I've been in conversation with uh, several of the people over the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the building, uh, building management, I, I'm probably using the wrong name, but um, and there, I know that there, there's an outside consulting firm being uh, requested to put something together for the city council to review. I just want to know how fast that's moving and if we know of any conclusion dates um, upcoming so that uh, hopefully we have some idea of what we can do with Cerritos Avenue with Baxter Elementary School, right on that street. Uh, so the school is going to resume sooner than ever. Um, we're uh, 
moving the time frames up for students to start. And um, I'm hoping that maybe something could be done or at least have an idea to uh, look, ho look forward to as far as some way to slow those people down. Thank you, Jennifer, for coming. Um, we don't, we don't, uh, you, you kind of alluded to some kind of study that we're doing. Uh, we don't need to wait for that. We can do something in the meantime. Um, Mr. Stewart, can we send the uh, traffic cop there on Cervitas Avenue? That's one thing we can do right away. I was going to ask what time, after, maybe after 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Yeah, it's which, always after dark. After dark. Okay, and yeah. we can also put in the, uh, the speed radar. You know, that's kind of flashing. If you're kind of speeding, it kind of flashes. Uh, it's not a, uh, a foolproof system, but at least it's a deterrent. Somebody, will, if somebody sees that the light is flashing, it will just kind of remind them that they are speeding. So those things we can do right away. Can we make them think their picture's being taken? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so those, those couple of things that we can do right away without going to speed runs and these things like that. Well, if, okay. if I can be of any help or assistance in that effort, Please feel free to give me a call. Well, what you can do is you can tell us approximately what time they're doing their thing, they're speeding. Like I said, that, that's, a, that's a big help. We'll park, okay. we can get vehicles and up it's, there in it's the meantime. seven days a week, it's not just weekends. Okay. And I think Mr. Greggy has an update on the timing of the, the work coming forward. Okay. All right, again, thank you so much for coming, expressing your concerns. All right, okay. thank you. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, um, just yeah, just an update on the consultant. Based on our uh, uh, the budget hearings and the money that was set aside to look at this, uh, we've contacted uh, one of the firms. Uh, we're in the middle of doing the paperwork. The idea would be to start with them at the beginning of the new fiscal year when the money sets, so they can do their work. Uh, you're probably looking anywhere to a 60, 90 day process of them reviewing uh, and coming up with different. Um, ideas and parameters for different speed control mechanisms um, in our local streets. Okay. That, that would be an update and stuff. We're, we're still well off. In the meantime, we'll get a black and white out there starting next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And let me just uh, tell our citizens here, if you notice there are some speeding happening on your street, you can call the uh, public safety department and then at least they can put in the speed trailer uh, in your street in the meantime. So because that's been going around your city. In fact, in my street, it's been there for um, a couple of times this year already. So that's something that we, you can request. Okay, if there's anything that you know the speeding, things like that, and always, you can always, also, we can always send out the uh, traffic cops to write tickets, okay? But uh, again, this is kind of a double-edged sword. Once they start writing a ticket, it might be you. So then complain later on that, uh, you're, you, you've got a ticket because you, you, you complained. Okay. All right, anyone else? Honorable Banner, City Council, City Staff. Hi, My name is Robin Snow. And, you know, I just think that this city is just going so fast. It's just amazing how many things that we're doing in this community. And I am just truly blessed to feel that I am part of this community that is doing such wonderful things. And I believe in this community so much that I've opened my second business. And I would like to let you know that Rose Cremation Services is officially now open. And we're located at 10160 Artesia Place. And we are, um, our phone number is 562 804-0404, and we provide any of your cremation services. So I just want to let you know that we are officially open. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Robin, do you have an exclusive on that activity of Bellflower? Of course. Okay. <laughs> do you also do pets? Do you cremate pets too? No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you thinking? This is the two-legged kind. <laughs> okay, Any, anyone else? All right. All right, we're moving along. Uh, item 11A, Mr. Stewart. This is a consideration of possible action to conduct a public hearing to consider an application from 
Julio Arroyo for the development review, parcel map, and site design review and adopt resolution 19-54, a resolution approving parcel map case number PM82589 to subdivide the existing 18,330 square foot lot into three single family lots and development review case DR3-19-9868 and site design review committee case number SDR19-01 to allow the construction of three two-story detached single family residences within the R1 PD zone, oh, zone and properly located at 14517 Woodruff Avenue. Okay, so I guess we, get, we have the big guns here for, from the planning department, huh? There's a koi pond, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's gonna start, uh, Ms. Corpus? Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, this evening the presentation will be given by the case planner, which is Mr. Justin Tamayo. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and the community. Um, agenda item 11A is an application to divide, subdivide an existing lot into three lots and construct single family homes on each of those lots. So the subject site is located on Woodruff, on the west side of Woodruff Avenue, just south of Lindale. It's currently developed with one single family home and one detached two car garage. The applicant is here this evening and available to answer any questions that the council or the community may have. Uh, he is requesting approval of a parcel map to subdivide the existing parcel into three lots, development review to construct the three new homes, and site design review to provide some flexibility from certain zoning requirements. This is the proposed site plan. So there's a few things going on here. These blue dash lines represent the proposed lots. So this would be lot one, lot two, and lot three with um, home one, two, and three. The green outline represents the proposed landscaping, orange represents the building footprints, and red represents the uncovered parking spaces. These next few slides contain elevations for the homes. All the homes incorporate Spanish style roofing, um, uh, ornamental wrought iron and light fixtures, and decorative columns and window shutters. So this is home one. That is home two, and that's home three. On May 20th of this year, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the project. At that public hearing, they did uh, raise some questions related to the owner's intention of living on the property, as well as the construction timeline. The applicant indicated that it is their intention to live on the property after it's constructed, and uh, they anticipate the construction timeline to be about 18 months after they pull permits. As part of staff's review, um, staff is recommending conditions of approval. The complete list can be found in the staff reports. However, some of the notable conditions include a homeowners association in order to enforce the uh, CCNRs, as well as um, requiring that the applicant incorporate additional building materials into homes one and two. As proposed, the project meets all the required findings for a parcel map, site design review, and development review and it's consistent with the land use element of the general plan. Um, more detail on those items can be found in the staff report as well. With that, staff's recommendation is to open the public hearing, take, test, uh, take testimonial and documentary evidence, and after considering the evidence, adopt resolution number 19-54, or alternatively, alternatively discuss, take other action related to this item. This concludes staff's presentation, unless there are questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Tamayo. That was a very succinct report. Um, just a few questions. Can you go back to the first slide? Oh, no, I mean, the, the, the colorful uh, slide. There you go. So where's the, pro where's the property line here between lots, uh, between the first and second, third property? Where's the property line? So this is one of the lot lines that's proposed, okay. separating right. lot one and lot two, and this is the other one separating lot two and three. Okay. And then um, you mentioned about, there's some mention about the vinyl fencing? Yes, so these um, landscape areas here, these private open space areas are proposed to be enclosed with vinyl fencing. So all the green ones will be vinyl fencing? Yes. Okay. 
And I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, there is a proposed block wall along the south property line. The existing perimeter block walls are existing. So this will not be replaced, the block wall here? No, it's not part of their proposal. Okay, and, this, and then the, also the east, east side will not be replaced too? No. This will be, okay. Will it be stockered? I'm sorry? Will it be stockered inside in the, on the, uh, facing the, prop, the, new, the uh, development? It is proposed as a precision wall. Um, we can make that a condition of approval. Okay. So, but it's not, I'm just kind of thinking if it was for one of the uh, uh, conditions from the Planning Commission. And I, I apologize, it, it actually is uh, part of the conditions of approval of number 21. Okay, okay. All right. Um, now, uh, there, there's a couple of things that I, that in the staff report, in the conditions um, that I was kind of looking, looking into. Um, if you turn to page, um, page 15 on condition number 22. So the garage will be used exclusively for the parking of 10 of residents' vehicles. This addition will be part of CCNR. Okay, that's, that's good. But how about the other conditions? Can those be in the CCNR like, let's say, number 23? All parking space are limited to passenger vehicles only, and at no time can the space be used for RV, trailers, and other recreational vehicles. Uh, which one is stronger, part of its conditions or part of the CCNR? Mr. Sita Turn, maybe you can chime in on this. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, when we review the CCNRs, we actually incorporate those types of conditions into the CCNRs as, so you have them both as conditions of approval and you have them as clauses within the CCNRs themselves. So all of this. So all of this, all of the relevant items, uh, the conditions that you've identified, and some of the other ones, for example, dwelling units must be equipped with automatic garage door openers, those types of things we actually incorporate into the CCNRs when we review them. Mm -hmm. So the CCNRs are actually submitted to the city for our office to review, and then they're approved and sent back to the property owner. Yeah, I'm just kind of making a distinction between number 22 because number 20 was very specific to be part of CCNR and the others were not. So I'm just trying to see wh why, do we, why are we doing that? And quite honestly, and, and the planning department can correct me if I'm wrong, but when the conditions of approval are put together, each department submits their own suggested draft conditions. And as a matter of drafting those conditions, they aren't necessarily uniform from the standpoint of a drafting standpoint. So each individual author from each individual department will send those conditions to the planning department, which are then incorporated into one set of conditions of approval. Our office will review them and to the extent practicable, meaning that we try to turn them around, these around quickly. Okay. We okay. review them all to make sure that there's some sense of uniformity, but you will see slight differences between the, the, the terms in and the conditions in here. Okay. But so so the, bottom, the bottom line is all of this will be in the CCNR. Correct. Okay. So I, I'm more confident there. Now, my, my other question on the CCNR is I know that one of the conditions here is that the staff will review it prior to recordation. The CCNR. Right. Okay. Correct. So what is our mechanism to make sure that it is actually recorded? Because I don't want, I want to in a position that we read prior to, but there's no feedback that it was actually recorded. It, and I'll have to defer to the director for okay. that. I want to find out we would what, get a, what's our mechanism to do that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we would get a copy of the recordation. So typically with the CCNRs, it's, it's required to be done. We verify that it's done through a recordation process. So typically they'd bring multiple copies to the LA County Recorder's office. One goes over the county recorder. The applicant keeps a copy and is required to give us a copy to show that it's been recorded. And usually there's a there's a stamp that the recorder's office provides mm -hmm. that shows that it's been recorded. So what's our follow through though, that it is actually recorded because the, it's, it's in the process. But how do we know what triggers that it is actually recorded? Because I know there's, some, there's an issue not related to this, that something wasn't actually recorded. So I'm kind of being very cautious so, Mr. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, I, I'm, I'm not going to speak to the city's internal practical implementation of that, but each developer for, for the CCNRs themselves has an, a vested interest in making sure those CCNRs are recorded on the property. 
for things other than the conditions of approval. And the reason for that is once the first piece of, of the property is conveyed and there's no CCNR attached to that property, that, that creates a problem for the private development itself. So all of the things, think about your own home. If you have CCNRs at your own home, there are various things in there that the city doesn't necessarily impose. So I'm just pulling things out of my hat. But if your lawn needs to look a certain way, or if you're not allowed to have signs out in your front yard, or you can't park cars in front of your private development, things like that, those aren't imposed by a governmental entity, but that's the private agreement between the landowners. So if the CCNRs aren't recorded ahead of time before that first property is conveyed, to a private property owner after it's after the house has been built, that creates a problem for the internal community and for the actual marketing of that particular development. So I say that only as a practical matter, the developer has a, a personal investment in making sure that the CCNRs are actually recorded. The city has a separate governmental interest mm -hmm. in doing so, and I can't speak as to the internal mechanism by which the city makes sure that happens. But as a practical matter, the developer itself has a has a vested interest in I think doing it. That's what he's asking. Is there is there a condition we can put on that would trigger a, a, a response by the the city to confirm that the CCNRs have been recorded? Right. Typically, it's a condition of their plan check approval, and sometimes even condition of their final sign off from planning in order to get their permits finalized. So there is several steps in the process that allows the planning department to hold up the developer until we get the proper So can you add that as a condition that the... We can. Yeah. Yeah, because I want to make sure make that towards the end... Yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree with you. I think remember, there, there, we have a separate issue here that yeah, I know. something wasn't recorded. Beth, can we add that as a last condition? We Assuming can. the council's good with it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, I think that's all I have. Any questions for the planning staff? Just a, a general comment, Mr. Mir, that I, Go ahead. I think the what you just came up with, you and Jeff and, and uh, our city manager, I'm sorry, and our director of planning, it's a, it's a good process. And um, I think that maybe that should be a standard process from now on, right? That we, mm -hmm. yeah, that uh, you know, we, we don't issue a, a construction permit until we receive the recordation and file. Again, just. An idea, but I think it's great. Thank you. That's yeah. it. Okay. Any question? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, uh, when I uh, looked at the plans, I noticed uh, I was looking at the landscaping, and and I'm and I'm aware that that under the site, uh, uh, you know, plan review, you know, they could, uh, you know, change around the landscaping in order to, uh, you know, comply. Um, the map exhibit had different numbers than the site plan exhibit. So just have that corrected down the road when, uh, again, all the plan sheets are submitted. Um, I did have a chance to go out there uh, and look, and, and I noticed a, a power pole that's t within the front yard setback off of Woodruff, and it seemed that like a lower kind of pole. Is that going to conflict with the the building, uh, the, the new home. Oh. Watch out, Carl. <laughs> 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 yeah, why is it, why is it right there? On the, uh, the pole's right there, right in the side yard. So is, is that pole high enough to, to clear the uh, the roof line? And, and As part of the development, they will be required to underground all their utilities. They will underground. Yeah. Okay, that's why I, I thought it was but it didn't, uh, it didn't reflect on any plans, at least I didn't see anything. All right, so you're going to go underground, all right. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is something down the road. Uh, 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 this process, you know, is pretty standard, and I know we've had a lot of these in town, so we've gone through it quite a bit. And um, I'm kind of for, in this kind of case, I'm kind of, for some streamlining, and if the planning commission saw it, cleared it, and everybody's okay, and if there's no appeal, whatever it may be, um, let it move, move on. So that's just a side uh, comment. Uh, that's maybe for future discussion, because obviously you know you can't do nothing tonight. Uh, so um, uh, that's just uh, something I I was kind of at first when I saw it, I'm going, oh, we have to see these too, you know, and then. Um, uh, so 
it's just something I, you know. You want to agenda that for a future meeting? Discussion? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. that's something you have for future. Fine, so, we so, so yeah. we we can talk about that later. So, all right. But other than that, it, it, again, it looks uh, you know, straightforward, and it had, you know, uh, you know, design wise, uh, uh, and some of the added features, you know, to help with that sort of called bowling alley driveway kind of thing, that long driveway, uh, exactly. you know, to break it up with the. Uh, uh, with the concrete strips uh, and so on, and then up front, and uh, looks like there's adequate uh, again landscaping, open space, and so seems to work out. Nice design. So, um, all right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hamada. All right. There, is there a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Second. Um, motion by Mayor Potem Garza, second by Council Member Coops to open the public hearing. Uh, without objection, that will be the order. We'd like to invite the applicant first. Maybe you can bring, if you have an architect. Uh, hi, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Right. Uh, please sign in so <coughs> our city clerk will have an easy task in identifying you. Uh, my name is Julio Arroyo, I'm the applicant. Good evening. Good evening, Firaz Jamal with Mercedes Engineering. I'm the designer of the project. We haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Where have you been? Good to see you again. <laughs> Here and there. Okay, you must have been busy, huh? <laughs> okay, very good. All right, Mr. Arroyo, talk to us about your project. Um, well, yeah, well, currently right now we're uh, living in a nice little two, two bed, one bath house. Um, myself along with my parents and uh, we, you know, came across the opportunity. We saw three houses, three uh, properties down, the nice big houses that were, uh, mm -hmm. that were developed. And uh, we said, you know, the, they're nice. <laughs> and, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be good to have something, not only something for us, since we do plan on um, at least living in one of them, and then potentially creating, you know, homes that someone else from the inner city of Bellflower, someone from another city coming in can enjoy, you know, and staying in a, in a, in a nice property in a nice city. And um, so, yeah, so we just decided so if we can go ahead and do it and get the approvals, and it's something that we would definitely love to, love to see and, and have. So you, you plan to demolish your existing house right now? Correct. Okay. And then uh, th do you plan on building those three homes at the same time or the first in the front or in the back um, and then while living in the current house? The, the, plan, the plan it would be uh, ideally to do the three at the same time, obviously, to, to me. A, a personal deadline that we would like to have um, as far as p completing the, the, the project. I guess that kind of just comes down to as far as, uh, you know, um, the, the financial point and the construction team that we'll be having and everything like that. So either we build one and going forward at the same time, or but the, ideally it would be to have all three done at the same, or being worked on at the same time, yeah. At the same time, okay, okay. Yeah. What do you, uh, how, what do you um, what's your budget to, to build those three homes approximately? What's your construction cost? Well, we're we're still I'm still bouncing around between uh, two or three different uh, uh, contractors, just kind of see, have an idea exactly. But uh, roughly, it's a little bit over a million to, for all three. How much? A million. A million for the three units. A little bit over, yeah. Okay, and those are about six total of six thousand over six thousand square feet, right? Correct. Total. The okay. total lot, each yeah. each one, yeah, a little bit yeah. over six thousand. Okay, okay. And uh, right now, you plan on living in one of the units. Uh, yes, and we'll be living in the in the third lot in the back. Do you plan to sell the other two right away? You want to rent them out, or? Mm. I guess uh, as of right now, yes, that would be the plan. I guess at the time when the project is finished, based on the market, see how things are going, might, we might be a slip, maybe random first, then sell them. But if not, the, the actual plans right now, the initial, is live in one and then sell two right away. As okay. soon as they're ready, for, uh, ready to sell. Uh, have you read all the conditions in the yes. staff report? Are, you, are they acceptable to you? Uh, with the exception of, was it one or two? Two of them. Two, plus yeah. the other condition that we just talked about in terms of recordation. Yeah, that, that, okay. that, one, that one's fine. But so what, what are those two conditions that are not acceptable to you? If I may, uh, real quick. So first, I want to thank the staff because, like usual, they help us and, and guide us throughout the process. But uh, on condition number 34, 
to, 34. Uh, okay. The suggestion is to include brick veneer on house one and two. I would like to see if we can remove that. Um, the houses are intended as Spanish style. Uh, I don't see how we can incorporate brick and in, or any other material into that design. Uh, it's not about saving any cost or anything. It's just about the design itself. I don't think uh, brick, brick or other material would complement the design itself. Uh, we did it on the third house because uh, the owner likes that idea and we thought it will work, it, it will fit. But with the front two houses, uh, we would like that. Uh, I mean, we have enough variations and, and shapes in, in the houses that I don't think it's, it's plain that requires additional building material to make it uh, more appealing. So any response from staff? Where, where, where do you envision the brick veneer to be in the houses one and two? Honorable Mayor, I think the intent of the condition was just to spruce up some of the aesthetics that could be visible from the street. So in just reviewing that front elevation, it looks like brick could be incorporated along the porch element, similar to the unit all the way into the rear. Um, it, it is just aesthetics. Um, really, we can go either way. All the houses are well designed. Uh, we just thought that the brick veneer could help enhance the, the aesthetics of both units. So any, any, any kind of suggestion to them where the brick veneer? Uh, Somewhere for some here? Or? Yes, I would suggest the porch area, which would include some of the columns and the side facing area for the porch. Okay, okay. So if you look at unit three, you can kind of see how that veneer wraps around the porch element. So it would be something similar here. Okay. And how about on, on, on unit number two? Same thing on the on the columns? So what you're anticipating? It could be the columns. Um, I mean, I think for this unit, there's several options. There could also be an opportunity for a wainscot, which is basically just like a three-foot high uh, okay. coat that wraps around the front. Um, I think this unit does have some options on what could be best placed. Just just to break the monotony. Uh, okay. Correct. Okay. Mayor, Council Member Dunn? Maybe the right word is not to use brick, maybe use kind of a hard, stone. hard, hard, not even to say stone, it could be tile too. I mean, it would, uh, a hard uh, veneer or something. Mm. You know, it's not, you know, I don't know what the terminology was, but. I think when you said Spanish style houses and you say brick, they don't go together either. So we could use. I get what the, uh, the intent is, is to. We can use decorative. Yeah, decorative veneer, yeah. And then mm -hmm. work yeah. with the applicant on yeah. what type of material would look mm -hmm. best. So are are you okay with that? Uh, if you if you uh, take out the word brick, will that be will that work out? So do you have some kind of options? Uh, you've heard yeah. where they're coming from. Yeah, I'll be happy to work with the staff again on this um, to see, to come up with something if, if we can. Uh, I'll be happy to try it and, and yeah. show it to them, but if, yeah. if it's possible to keep it open, like not we have to do it, and keep it open to the staff to determine that later on, uh, because it might not look as appealing once we, we reflect it on the rendering. Uh, I'm just. I don't, I'd like to leave it to opinion. staff's discretion. Yeah, that's yeah. what you meant by open and staff's right, discretion right, right, to right. come up with an idea. We're we're not designers. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Beth, you okay with that? Yes. Okay. okay. So we, to make it more general, so we can really work with the applicant, we can revise condition number 34 to say the applicant must incorporate decorative elements mm -hmm. for houses one and two, subject to the review by the director. Ex uh, must incorporate exterior decorative elements. And okay. so that could be a combination of veneer or it could be other okay. other materials. So they're yeah. giving as much flexibility as possible. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, before we move on, um, you said subject to the review. Okay, and approval. I was going to ask that. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. You. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, the other one is regarding the HOA. Okay. Uh, as you know, we've done so many of those and uh, we usually we go with the uh, CCNRs. Uh, 
as, as you said before, that this is going to be recorded. It's, it will clearly s state all the conditions. And uh, normally, there's an there's uh, easement that's uh, going to be between all the lots. And that's also part of the map. And each uh, homeowner is responsible for that part of the lot. So if there's a driveway in front of unit one, the maintenance of that driveway will be on the owner of the first house. And that's part of the CCNRs. So I don't know uh, why we have to do HOA at this point, since it's going to be. Well, I, I can tell you what, because um, if I own the, uh, the first unit and the second unit's car is passing through my driveway, and the, the own and the car on the third property passes through my driveway. That means there's more, there's more uh, traffic coming through my. If 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 I'm hearing what you're saying, <coughs> that if that is my driveway, that means that um, the wear other owners are using my driveway. That means they're more wear and tear on my driveway. Right. So logically, logically, if all things work out. I'll be replacing my driveway more often than the third unit. I don't think he's talking. You're, you're okay if the CCNR is recorded. Yes, you just don't want to okay do the HOA, yes. correct? The HOA, the creating the no. HOA. Any downside of that, Beth? I mean, just don't do it with the HOA and just record the no, CCNR? No, but how, how do you share the cost, though? In the CCNRs, yeah. you did put the formula in and record them. Um, the issue with the HOA, then, it, if the way I understand it, it has to be recorded with the state. It has to be like. Um, <laughs> voting and meetings and usually those people try mm -hmm. to stay away from those because it's, it becomes like condos and we want to mm -hmm. make sure that yeah. those are single families each lot is more than six thousand square feet like that he's going uh, well as you know, long as my, my one of my, mm -hmm. I, I'm my, my concern my, my concern is the inequity in terms of the wear and tear that mm -hmm. one of the things wear and tear of the driveway well if we okay. find a deficient say there's a problem we find a, a code enforcement issue there and it's recorded the CCRs, they have to handle it. Then is it not really up to them on how they handle it? They share the cost equally, I presume, on making that repair. And they're, they're all held equally liable on the titles of those houses, correct? Yes. And that's, that's, how we, that's how we do so it. So it's more of a planned development. Right. PDs, you don't have right. a, a HOA. With three units, yeah. I think you can get away without doing an HOA, yeah. but that's yeah. just. You, you can. Yeah. And then the mechanism to make sure that all the conditions are enforced for maintenance would be the CCNRs. So the, the cost of the common area is shared by the three units? Well, really, it would be up to the three, the three property owners. Yes. Right. So, but there's going to be a mechanism to do it, because I don't want to be in a situation where in the development has been approved, it's been and then sold many times, and then later on, the owners, they, they kind of fight in terms of how do we share this cost, you know. So I want to make sure that from, from the outset, it's right. very clear how they will share in the cost of maintaining the common areas. Right. You review and approve the CCRs in draft form, correct? Before that, they go. That's correct. So can you ensure that those, that formula is met, that there's a formula portion of those costs that automatically triggers in the event of a substandard issue? And Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the answer to that question is yes. The secondarily, we always add in a clause that the city is a third party beneficiary mm -hmm. to the CCNRs, which means that the city, if it has to step in for code enforcement purposes, will hold all the property owners equally responsible for the, the joint costs of fixing whatever problem there might be and reimbursing the city for its enforcement costs. So that's a standard clause that we add to every CCNR. Uh, the other issue has to do with the formula between the, the the various units and that will be part of the ccnrs because the developers hearing the problem right now and so we'll verify that, that indeed there is a formula there for each successive property owner yes can i um before we finalize that mr mm -hmm. mayor can i go ahead can yeah. i ask a question so i i for me the and i respect where the mayor's coming from in terms of the maintenance i think that's absolutely has credibility uh, my interest in and uh, retaining the HOA condition is the fact that for me, it retains the look of the whole development, right? Because with an HOA, it requires that, that the development be maintained at a certain level and it has a certain aesthetics. I can foresee like maybe this unit not, if it's independent and having different aesthetics, different uh, uh, landscaping than this one, and maybe it's subpar in maintenance, whereas this one, if they're doing everything they can, maintaining the property, and this one isn't, and this one is, 
now you have a, a lack of uniformity in the look. And if I'm seeing your design, it looks like you're going for a, a pretty, um, a pretty uniform set of design standards that you're trying to maintain in this development. So for me, the appeal of the HOA is that it, it forces for this to be pretty uniform, not only in the design, but in the maintenance element as well. Whereas if we remove the HOA condition, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that's, that's required. Or am I wrong? It, I would never say that you're wrong. No, no, no. I, Mr. <laughs> Mayor, members of the council, I, I, I think the perhaps the difference just to make sure that we're we're understanding what page we're on. The CCNR is actually that is the basis for the agreement between the property owners. The HOA is the governance of how mm -hmm. that those CCNRs are implemented. But any CCNR, whether there's an HOA or not, allows each individual property owner to enforce the terms and conditions of those CCNRs against another property owner. The HOA creates a governance unit similar to a city, for example, for that particular development. In this instance, there are only three units. So the HOA would be comprised of mm -hmm. those three property owners in any event. And I think with the develop, I would never advocate on behalf of the developer, but I understand their point, which is you only have three units. If you create an HOA, that HOA will be comprised of those mm -hmm. property owners from those three properties. So what's the difference between the HOA and just having the CCNRs enforced by those three property owners in any event? Those standards are still enforceable because they're within the CCNRs. It's just that the difference is there would be no HOA to enforce them. Each individual property owner would be enforcing against the other two property owners, which would happen in any event. So, I, I only put that out there for discussion purposes. So, so what is their mechanism to go after the next uh, property owner if, let's say, the next property owner is not living up to their standards of upkeep? It's the same as if there was an HOA, which is the HOA has the power to file suit against that property owner. Uh, each individual property owner has the ability to file suit against the other property owners. So the enforcement mechanism is the same whether you have an HOA or an individual property owner. The difference is, is that for larger developments, say more than 10, all of those 10 units are then contributing their homeowner's dues toward that HOA, so the HOA as an independent entity has the ability to file suit using its own funds rather than an individual property owner using their own funds to enforce the CCNRs against the other ones. Am I making so, sense? Yeah, uh, as, my, my concern is as long as there's a mechanism to, for one property owners to go after the others if the others are not keeping up the end of the bargain, so to speak. And the CCNRs themselves okay. is that contract. It, okay. The CCNR is, is it's, when it comes down to it, it's a contract between those property owners to agree to keep the same standards uniform amongst them. And in this instance, the only difference is, is that there are only three property owners to begin with. So that means if even if you had an HOA, mm -hmm. those three property owners would be contributing to that HOA. And if one of the property owners wasn't living up to the standards and the HOA made a decision, it would still be a 2-1 vote to, for example go against that one property owner, which they would have the right to do in any event, whether there was an HOA or not. Mm -hmm, okay. I think I think developers' point is they can do an HOA, but as a practical matter, it's the same rights with three units as if there was no HOA because the standards themselves are, are encapsulated within the CCNRs. And it avoids not having an HOA for the developers, avoids them having to run through the Department of Real Estate Make sure that that HOA is in essence incorporated. Have bylaws. Have an mm -hmm. annual meeting. Collect homeowners' dues. All that type of thing. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just making sure that okay. we're understanding I, the argument. I just think that within personally, I, and with all due respect, and I appreciate the um, the opinion. I just think an HOA would again have the uniformity. Whether we have the uniform landscaping throughout. Um, I know that if, if I lived here and my neighbor here in the back um, all of a sudden wants to go with a bright yellow that you can see from space, um, I'd have an issue with that. If I and may, I don't know that an HOA, I mean, a, a CCNR would be able to. Can, can I, so. uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that's something that since this is PUD, any changes to the design or the paint or anything, they still have to come back to the city and get approval. Yeah. So I don't think, I mean, they still have to go through, I think, planning commission, not just the staff, because this is PUD. So that's, 
there's still a uh, way to, to govern that. Um, I just think it puts more of a burden on the individual homeowner rather than the HOA. Everyone has to agree on all the standards. I think the HOA forces everyone to be on the same page, whereas the other way, it's everyone's individual and it forces the individual to keep their neighbor in check and have to undertake the process to to enforce. So because the HOA is still the same people. Yeah. I mean, Correct. Yeah. I guess that. there's no third party or like a separate like in bigger uh, associations there's they hire a company that they manage the HOA and they have a architectural committee they have other committees but in this case three homeowners it's just a burdensome on on them it's I, I know um, like five unit uh, projects that we've done and I hear the homeowners they're complaining about the HOA and having to deal with uh, paying fees and having to have special insurance and all that kind of stuff that it just a burden on them it becomes like a con living in a condominium versus the appeal of having a uh, single family house which you know we're trying to achieve here well the HOA just kind of provides a an automatic forum for a homeowner to basically uh, get some kind of enforcement among the owners and let me share with you that in my neighborhood one of the properties they only have two properties but they have HOA so they have to appoint one person that is mutually accessible to both. So that's even more difficult, but they make uh, it happen. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I respectfully, I get that. I, I get where you're coming from, but at the end of the day, you're, you're the one that's proposing a three unit development. So, I mean. Yeah, and we did like the 21 units next door. I don't think we did HOA on those either. Um, so, I don't know if this is the first project or what's yeah. the. I, I the uh, let me interject. Yeah, sure. I don't think we've we've had an HOA on any planned development that we've done in the city. This mm -hmm. is the only time, first time I think I've ever remember talking about it. Uh, we've done it as long Mr. as Mayor, I remember. Yeah. Yes, Council Have any of you members ever been a member of an HOA? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I'm in five of them, yeah. <laughs> and I'm I, president I, of three of them. I have. Yeah. And it's a big job. You've got dues. You got insurance. You got to have an annual meeting. You got to file income tax to the feds, to the state. They're nonprofit. It's a big deal. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I live on Tremont Lane. And you know why it's called Tremont Lane? It's because it had trees on it. Many of the trees were there <coughs> from when it was a site before it was developed. <coughs> we closed escrow on Friday. On Sunday morning, I could hear chainsaws. Four of my neighbors cut down the Tremont trees that were meant to be part of the community. <laughs> <laughs> now, once they're gone, they're gone. Okay. Right? So did you file a so, complaint with the homeowners yeah, association? Yeah, now where do you begin? These are your brand new neighbors. <laughs> you're, you're trying to get along. God is love. <laughs> and likewise, you have to trust the people that live in your neighborhood. Not mm -hmm. unlike if there were three houses built along Woodruff and all met on the curb. You are in hopes that they all have mm -hmm. the same idea of what a good ho looking house is. But I really believe that, as Mr. Dutton has indicated, the PDs, and we're all members of the Planning Commission at one point or another, we've all been there, that I think the CCNRs are going to be more than adequate to maintain the integrity of the property without adding a whole bunch more paperwork and meetings and income taxes. And I think in the defense of the, the developer, he can actually sell something, an individual item, that's going to be easy for him to market rather than have another layer of $120 a month or whatever it costs to maintain an HOA. And also, you know, I'll piggyback on it, HOA is designed also as a revenue source to take care of common grounds, like when you have condominiums, you're sharing roofs, you're sharing barbecue mm -hmm. party areas, you're having a gardener, you're having all kinds of things. You may have an, a, a community trash bin you have to share. Individual homes, they're gonna be responsible for each maintenance on each of those homes. Um, one thing is, you know, Sonny was except, talking about the... Except the driveway. Well, no, and then you were talking about the driveway. Well, there's also sewers under the ground, and I'm assuming there's one trunk line coming right. from all three hoses. Right. So mm -hmm. the driveway theory also works with the sewer line. <laughs> and then you have walls. Say, say a car goes into that wall on the driveway side or something, it has to be fixed or whatever. So that's when all three would come in and, and take care of that, and I'm sure the CCNRs take care of that. And I might have a little mm -hmm. different attitude if it was a gated community mm -hmm. because then you add another whole layer of security. Now you need a phone system. 
Now you need somebody to maintain the gate. Now you have somebody to do the hydraulics in the gate. Now you have sprinklers out in front. Those are all the things that I face at some of my developments. But see, this is just a free mm -hmm. flow street um, that doesn't require that kind of activity. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Uh, 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 thank you. Um, the, um, I'm trying to recall that there's been a number of projects that have uh, uh, HOAs and um, is our code written in a fashion that it said that requires the HOA because of the way the conditions are written, it says required. So there's no, there's no, no, code there's no code provision right. that requires so I, I, I want to get that point out that, um, and, um, and in past, I know we've seen various size projects and um, was there a threshold we tried to establish on, on what may, I know there's, you know, again, this is only three and uh, there was a number 10 that was mentioned and, and, you know, there's, there's a difference between a parcel map and a track map and, and, you know, and that, that yeah. number and, uh, we never came up to, uh, with any, there's, is there any threshold on record that, that was established to, to require it? No. All right. No formal threshold. So what I'm getting to is it's kind of open. To yeah. It is. So um, um, I can, you know, again, I can see for some sort of organization of, I mean, just to organize these three and make sure they're all on board. To, uh, is it an HOA? I'm not, I'm not sure. It's, it's not required. I just heard. So um, uh, and I'm hearing CCNRs have, have enough teeth in it to, and if the city's also sort of rolled into it, then we can make sure about enforcement and, right. and everything else. So, okay. all right. Uh, there seems some options. I'll be living in the back, so I'll be. I'll yeah, be yeah, yeah, you're, you're the guard I'll, anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll be supervising <laughs> to make yeah. sure that. You're yeah, the spotter. I mean, you got it. Yeah. 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 And that's as long as you live there. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, I, and that's if, if I may just um, kind of to add to it. I mean, I've stayed in the city of Belfort for my entire life, and I plan on being here for a good while, which is why we, we're doing this, to make, add to the city's beauty that it is already, as somebody else mentioned, as fast as it's growing and, and everything, we want to be a part of it. I just want to be yeah. And like what I've seen in other communities is in situations like this is hopefully, and we pray that all, all in this case, all three get along. Because yeah. if they don't, then it's, you know, then it's a mess, uh, so, all right. All right, okay. thank you, Mr. All right, Mayor. thank you. Any other comments, questions? Good? Okay. Thank you. Thank, uh, any other questions. conditions that you don't want? Uh, no, just those two? Yes, just those two. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'd like to invite the members of the public if you want to share your comments. It's now your chance to chime in. Come on up. I think Dan brought up some very, very valid points. It's, it's Thank a, you. It's another <laughs> layer of intervention that has to take place when if people can't work it out, move. <clears throat> if you don't like it, move. First of all, if there was an HOA attached to those one of those three, I wouldn't even consider moving there just because there's an HOA. I have so many friends that it just, it causes more trouble than it's worth. Um, it's hard enough when you've got neighbors moving in and out, renters. I mean, that would be a, a situation where I would prefer to see an HOA so that you could get them to not have their tree drop their stuff on your barbecue, <laughs> which is a situation I've got every year when the tree grows over my fence. Um, it, that's, that's difficult enough, but the HOA for ownership, I mean, people should respect their neighbors and they should be able to get along. And if they can't, well, there's, there's legal ramifications that you can go through. So anyway, that's just my opinion. 
All right, thanks for sharing your testimony. Anyone else? May or not seeing anybody, I guess. I think that's time to close the pu public hearing. Second. Motion by May, uh, Council Member Dunn, seconded by Council Member Hamada to close the public hearing. Okay, so let's talk about the, the two mm -hmm. conditions that. I'm for veneer and uh, no HOA. Uh, decorative veneer <laughs> that's subject to. Uh, yeah. do, do you have the language for the. Uh, yeah, and I'm good with the rest of the project. Condition. So I, I, I have a quick question, Mr. Mayor, if you don't uh, mind. Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem Garza. Um, I, I, I am admittedly not an expert in CCRNRs. Um, <laughs> so I'll put that out I there. I think but anybody is. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I understand the street is here. So hypothetically, right, this is a private property, private property, private property. That's fine. So I don't know where I, I it was triggered because of a comment from Council Member Dutton, which I think is valid. I mean, I, everything you said was valid, but. Yeah, it, I don't know where the sewer trunk line is within this project, but if the sewer trunk line, just again for as an example, is here. Okay, great. So if it's there, right in the middle, and if there's a block in that sewer trunk line sometime in the future, and it's here, and that's blocking the waste that these uh, units are discharging going this way. If this, if it's located there and this property owner for some reason cannot afford to fix a trunk line that's here within his property line under the CCNRs, what rights would these two have to force this person to fix that line so that they can have a, their continued quality of life? I don't know how the CCNRs would work in that situation. We, we can get the designer up here, but I'm sure that's an easement. That that driveway is a whole easement area, and so they all got to chip in and pay. Either that, or you do a DNA test and find out uh, who did the blockage. So, so, <laughs> so again, for me, that would be the interest is the fact that I know an HOA would be able to repair that common use. I'm correct. So, whereas if we don't have an HOA and that happens. Uh, there's no, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but if the CCRNRs. So, so that, thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I, I hate answering hypotheticals, but for purposes of your hypothetical, yeah. they all own the real property. So when you say they can't afford it, a judge is going to look at that and say, no, you can't afford it. You have real property. You can borrow against that property, or those two other property owners can sue you, recover their whatever it takes to fix that problem and lien your property. So the remedy is for those two property owners to either force that to happen or to take care of the problem on their own at their own cost and then recover from that third property owner for those costs. But that, uh, again, uh, that would be, the scenario you're talking about would be after the fact, like we're going to a judge, there's a lawsuit. I'm, I'm talking real life, like this thing needs to get fixed now because otherwise these two well, quite frankly, if that were the case, then if I'm property owner three, I'm going to call out a plumber and have it fixed, and I'm going to expect property owner one to reimburse me for the cost, and if they don't, I'm going to end up in court to collect my costs. Would, would property owner three have the right to go in here and hire somebody to dig that driveway and fix that line ASAP? I imagine that the CCNRs will have that in there, okay. because they typically do. But well, I can't say definitively for this project because I don't have the CCNRs okay. in front of me. Most, that's what likely, I would, that's most likely I, I will say yes because it's a common area. Well, it's an easement. Mm -hmm. I, and it's all a co common area among the three of them. It, it's, a, it's a common easement, meaning that all three property owners mm -hmm. have the right to use that particular easement. Okay. So it's not a matter where you have to get permission to go on to the easement. You already have that permission as a, as a co-owner of that easement. Okay. Got it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Any other comments? Uh, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, no matter. Go ahead. I thought I heard during the testimony of the applicant, uh, did he build the large project that, that goes between Woodruff and Washington? Was that the same developer? No, it's different. Oh, okay. Designer. Oh, designer. designer. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, all right. I thought one of you said it. He's a and, familiar face here. So. Yeah, all right. So and I thought the designer indicated that there was no C CCNRs on that large project. Oh, I'm sorry, HOA. Yeah. Oh, 
Why don't you come Councilman yeah. Mada, do you want to reopen the public hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there was. That's, that's to true. make it proper. So. Yes. Uh, may I? Okay. Uh, Open, make you a, may. Make a motion. Uh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. Yeah. <laughs> we just all got to talk. Okay. Go ahead. If, Make a motion. Make a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll so, second it. So I'm sorry. Uh, the motion was to reopen the public hearing by Councilmember Hamada, seconded by Councilmember Garza, without objection. That will be the order. Okay, mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Jamal Firaz, yeah. Firaz Jamal, just please come forward. Just, just to confirm that that there was no HOA on that that uh, larger project. There was no condition of approval requiring HOA. That's that I know. Oh. If the developer chose to, H to do HOA afterwards, I don't know. Oh. As far as I know, there was no condition from the city to require him to do an HOA. Um, but that's, I mean, that doesn't mean. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm, this I'm is just, just trying to find some consistent uh, consistency in. Right. Yeah. As far as I know, in all the projects we've done before, there was never condition to do HOA. CC on ours, yes, oh. and we've done it. Yeah. Uh, but just to answer real quick, if I may, about the driveway. Uh, it is a common easement. It will be recorded on the map as an easement for access and for underground utilities. Okay. So any problem with sewer or anything like that, it will be the right for any homeowner to go and get a plumber to check it. There will be um, uh, clean outs throughout. Plus this is gonna be four inch ABS that with 2% slope that I'm sure, well, I don't wanna say I'm sure, but in, in 50 years probably it won't clog because it's not like the clay ones that usually accumulate and cause problems. Thank you, I appreciate so, you clarifying so that. So that versus the HOA, I mean, it's... Yeah, just yes. clarifying, thank you. Thank you. Wait a minute, right. just to, to clarify my, was that there's 26 homes? That's three three lots over? Uh, 21. 21 homes with no yeah. HOA. That's and then right. I believe there was 16, 12 or 16 homes on Carpendero Street that we did without an HOA. Mr. Mayor, we're trying to recall whether or not an HOA was required or not. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't have the resolution here, so we mm -hmm. can't confirm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. At this moment. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Nope. Thank you. Move to close the public hearing. Second. A motion by Councilmember Coop, second by Councilmember Hamada to close Final. the public hearing. Without objection, that will be the order. All right. Let's continue on in our discussion. See, I'm telling you, this is. Uh, uh, let me just share that. Um, you're very fortunate as an applicant because this is the first time that uh, we're hearing something as a city council where all members are former planning commissioners, so. <laughs> That's true. And who is the oldest, the longest planning commissioner? Uh, Mr. Coops. Yeah, thank you. He's been there for 60 <laughs> years. Oh, no. <laughs> He's been in the planning commission for 60 years. That's worth something, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, you couldn't get it of the farm team. <laughs> <laughs> we need to give him a medal. I went All right. The, I went on the planning commission when Eisenhower was president. You know. <laughs> All right. Any other comments? So, may, may for them, are you okay with the without the HOA? I absolutely. My my concerns have been addressed. I appreciate that, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Just want to make sure that. Uh, All right. Moving along, is there uh, where do we uh, any? Any, is there a motion to? I'll make a what's motion. Your, what's your pleasure? <laughs> I would say, what's your pleasure? <laughs> make a motion to. Uh, <clears throat> make a motion to uh, approve the project at 14517 um, as conditioned with uh, leaving the condition in about the decorative veneer to staff's uh, uh, liking and uh, no HOA. Second. Uh, motion by uh, Council Member uh, Danton, seconded by Council Member Hamada uh, for the City of Council, City Council Bellflower to adopt resolution 19-54 as amended on um, the, the decorative veneer and HOA. Mr. Mayor, uh, and there yes. was talk of adding a condition that the recordation be recordation confirmed. Recordation be confirmed, oh, yes. yes. With that. Uh, yeah. You have a choice prior to finalization of permits? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. That and would we'll be the motion. Yep. So, there'll be th th so there are three changes mm -hmm. in terms of the conditions. Do, okay. we, need a, do we need to include the uh, parcel case number in it for the record? No, oh, okay. it's resolution. Okay. okay. So that's good enough. Resolution 19-54 is okay. clear enough. Fine. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hamada? Aye. Councilmember Coops? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Garza? Aye. Councilmember Dutton? Aye. Mayor Santangas? Aye. 
All right, there are no um, ordinances or resolutions for considerations. There are no consideration items, uh, so we're gonna be moving along to uh, consent calendar. Does anyone have, like to, I'd like to pull uh, items 14, uh, 14J and 14K. Mayor? Yes, Councilman Dutton. I need to recuse myself from 14F and 14H due to owning property uh, too close to those mm. items. Okay, noted. Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, just, uh, 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 just some clarification on 14J and 14K. I, that was uh, on the... Uh, on the conflict of, of interest sheets, uh, my name was um, included on those. Uh, in past, I, I, I've indicated that yes, I'm a board member of Kingdom Causes. I'm not compensated for being a member of that board, so I've been so advised by the attorney in past uh, uh, that I can I can sit on and you can participate. And participate. Okay, duly noted. Anyone else? Okay, is there a motion to? Um, Adopt, approve the, the balance of the uh, consent calendar. Move the consent calendar. Second. Okay, motion by uh, Council Member Coops, seconded by Council Member Hamada to approve the, uh, the consent calendar. So I, I pulled items 14J and 14K because it pertains to um, the uh, renewals of the contract with agreement with Kingdom Causes. And I thought that um, this is a, um, a very timely topic and I'd like to just get an update in terms of what was accomplished um, uh, the last the last year in terms of those two agreements with Kingdom Causes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Travis has the stats, and I'm going to have him fill you in on on what was accomplished based on the uh, the reports that we were provided. Do we have somebody for? We do. Yes. Okay. okay. Come on up. So it's your opportunity to shine. <laughs> so 14J is the um, is the agreement for to renew for homeless prevention and rapid rapid rehousing, and then uh, 14K is for the um, uh, employment and training opportunities through Good Soils Industries. Mr. Mayor, Honorable Council, uh, thanks for having us up here to talk about our agreements and the work that we've had the pleasure of doing along with your team. Um, I brought my, uh, my colleague, Becky Vanderzee, who's our Director of Housing. Um, so we're gonna start out with talking about the homeless prevention and rapid rehousing program that we've done over the last couple of years. Hello, everybody. I have to get like the introductions right. So Honorable Mayor and City Council, Thank you for having us here today. Sometimes, sorry, I'm not sure how to address, so thank you. Um, since we met with Travis, um, some of our numbers have been updated with more households that we have served, so I just wanna give some updated numbers. With our um, prevention program, we have two different pockets of funding that we utilize for that program, and one is a one-time assistance, um, rental assistance, and the other pocket is an ongoing, what we call a voucher program that provides a certain um, subsidy per month for up to 12 months of assistance for different um, households. So the one-time assistance could be a rental arrears, or it could be move-in assistance, it could be utility assistance, those are all different types of assistance that we provide in there. So total, we have served 31 households um, with this funding that we have, um, 26 of those have been in that one-time assistance pocket. Um, five of those then have been with the, the voucher program in there. So I recognize that those are not reaching the goals that we had set up um, with this program. So the goals initially were to do 40 um, households in the um, one-time assistance and then 15 in the ongoing voucher program. So I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of the, uh, the numbers and the, the information of what we've seen this year and our different um, assessments and the households that have come in. So we have done the pre-screening for 103 different households for this. And then with those numbers, see 31 of those have qualified for the assistance or not qualified necessarily. Some of them have been lost to contact 
in the midst of our um, working towards getting them assessed and all the paperwork processed for that program. So it's actually 25 of those 103. Actually, we um, lost contact, phones not working anymore, couldn't get in touch with families before we were able to actually approve the households. Um, 19 of those actually were not um, qualified due to their income limits. So right now, um, this program is to serve um, families or households that fall under 30% of the area median income. Um, and fortunately, we often see households that are just above that. That's typically what we see when people don't financially qualify for this program. The other side of that is sometimes people are paying more than 80% of their income towards their rent. And that's not a sustainable measure for us to provide some assistance in order to have good faith that they're gonna be able to continue to pay their rent. So that's one of the standards of this program as well as when we see that we can't provide the assistance as well. Um, some of the people that came to us um, didn't represent a hardship. They just said we would like rental assistance. Um, we didn't have a three day notice. We didn't have a 60 day notice. We didn't have a 30 day notice, nothing. Um, so we couldn't prove that there was actually a hardship or a reason why they weren't able to pay their rent and that's another reason sometimes why people didn't get didn't get approved um, for this funding um, for the assistance that we have available um, I'm not sure if, should I talk about what we're doing the ideas to move forward Travis can, can you give us some, yeah. I have some questions yeah. before you move forward yeah, uh, can you explain in terms of rental assistance uh, what kind of assistance yeah uh, is it the the whole amount of rent sometimes Sometimes. Yeah. So, so it's, is, is there a cap? Is there oh, a cap in terms of oh, how much you're assisting? The, the rental assistance yeah, yeah. So if we do a one-time rental assistance, we typically pay, pay either a month or two of rental arrears. If somebody has a three-day notice, an eviction notice, if we can help save that and prove that they're able to pay their rent going forward, sometimes it's um, one month or two months. So the max is two months. That's typically where we're at. Sometimes we've done. Is there a cap done, on the amount that you give assistance to? There's no to? cap on the amount at this time in this year's so they could um, be a, contract. So they could be renting a mansion? No, I'm just. We mm -hmm. don't do that. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we do okay. a lot of vetting. Oh, <laughs> we do a lot of vetting of the households. And then for the um, ongoing assistance, it's $333 a month. That's per, the voucher? Yes. Okay. Per household for up to 12 months. So they could get that up to 12 months of the of the year. We typically average that around six months. So can you tell us how do you uh, make contact with them? How do I identify yeah. which one to, to help out? Oh, which which program to help out in? No, 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 the, the clients. How the do you identify the clients? Okay. So um, we get a lot of referrals from BUSD, um, the school district here. We get uh, um, referrals from um, churches as well. And then we get walk-ins and calls from people that are just looking for rental assistance. We ran a housing um, homelessness prevention and rapid housing program prior to us doing the work with our homeless neighbors. So we're still kind of known for that sometimes in the community. So sometimes family members will say, hey, before we got assistance from Kingdom, Belt, Kingdom Causes, so they'll send you know other friends to us, that kind of thing. But primarily through the school district and through different churches is how we're getting referrals. For the rapid rehousing, um, mm -hmm. Where else are you getting funding from other than Bellflower? Lhasa. Lhasa, Lhasa. and the COG. Okay. Gateway Cities okay. COG, okay. yeah. What yeah. percentage of the funding for house, uh, rapid rehousing is from Bellflower? Of the rapid rehousing that we do? Let's say you have a total budget of X number. Of for for X. our housing programs? Ooh. So I would say that's a, that was, uh, our housing programs probably constitute about 800,000 of our budget. And uh, what Bellflower provides is 162. 60. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think the other unique thing to think about with this, um, we've been getting a lot of requests from people on fixed incomes who the rental market is going up, but their income is not going up. Mm -hmm. So senior citizens on Social Security, right. mm -hmm. things like that. We're starting to get a lot more calls for that because the average cost for an apartment, if you look on Craigslist, is about 1500 but Social Security is at like 990 890. 890. So that's, I think, when we think about homeless prevention and rapid rehousing, we have to really focus on the prevention piece um, because there are growing, um, like, as Measure H rolls out, um, we're seeing those other pockets, but we're not seeing something that necessarily fits this vulnerable population that 
would be homeless if not for this particular pocket of funding. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a unique thing. Over the next year, we're looking at um, uh, changing some of the restrictions to see, well, we're, can we talk about that? We're raising, yes. yeah, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, uh, ahead. members of the city council, um, we did look at the regulations for the successor housing agency in the state, and it does allow for um, us to expand that target population. And as long as we have the documentation to back that up, that they would be homeless, um, if it wasn't for this assistance, then we are able to contribute funding to 50% um, of the AMI or, or below. Oh, okay, okay. So again, the goal is to prevent them from being homeless. Yeah, okay. and there's still a small pocket that's set aside to help. Um, we, we're really good at leveraging other funds. Like we leverage funds from the Gateway Cities COG from um, LASA through a contract with PATH and also through the Kaiser Foundation. Um, but there's still like households that like kind of slip through the cracks of um, the different rules and regulations for each funding stream. And that's um, where some of LMI has been able to help us with some of those move-ins as well. So um, I think it's, it's majority of it is really pr doing the homeless prevention, which is good in the long haul because if you allow a household to become homeless, if it's really due to a crisis, we often see um, medical, issues where like the main breadwinner is in the hospital or there's there's a mm -hmm. loss of income or there's uh, a, a divorce or a split and the, ma the main um, income driver like leaves the household. Um, it's often those like critical things where they really just need short-term assistance to get back on their feet and that's what we really target with this funds. Our intention is not to um, try to fund somebody in housing if they really can't sustain it on their own or if they could do more to, to cover the cost of their rent. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but yeah, we're really interested to see, uh, we talked to Travis earlier today about just increasing the communication be between us and staff with the trends that we're seeing, because originally the restrictions were such that it was hard to find, same same tension with the homeowner um, program where the, the rules are hard to qualify people for, but also to find people that have enough money to sustain that okay. housing. Okay. So that's what we're working on with staff mm -hmm. is to see, can we, can we move those around so we could help more people who truly just need like a, a little boost of help and then they would be fine. Mm -hmm. Now, another question here is, since uh, you're able to serve less than the, the number of, uh, less than the goal mm -hmm. in terms of the number of participants or clients, uh, does it mean that we have some carryover funds into next year? We only bill on a reimbursement basis. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So that the, any carryover should be on ours, in our books. Yeah, but it would be reallocated the, the next, next year, okay, rebudgeted. Okay. All right, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Correct. So uh, since the goal was 40 and 15, uh, is it the same goal for this coming year? Correct. Oh, so, so how do you plan to, to meet this goal this time? So I think with, um, with raising the 30% AMI limit to 50%, our hope is that so mm -hmm. – we had a hundred. We did all the work with a hundred and four households. So that means all the staff time, all the, all the meetings and case management. But out of those, only thirty-one. Is that right? Thirty-one qualified. So our hope is that by moving the thirty percent up to fifty, that we could actually capture other people that would have been able to receive mm -hmm. that assistance. Okay. Um, and so that's one thing. And we're, we'll be meeting ongoing about. Yeah. Go ahead, Becky. Stop. A couple other ways that we're hoping to address those goals is also to do more um, publicizing within the school district as well, showing up at the um, different informational sessions that they have at the school, so not just at Caring Connections, but actually being at the school when the parents are there as well. Um, we're working in partnership with The Whole Child, which is our main family service provider here in SPA 7. And so they're an organization as well that has some prevention funds, but utilize us when it comes to Bellflower and with our Norwalk prevention funds as well, so that they can utilize those funds for other cities that don't have um, prevention programs, so we walk alongside them. We're also, um, we, we now are taking, we have an MSW intern who we're adding to this staff, who we hope can expand some of the outreach that we do as well to get more families um, into this program. Um, as well as long as they qualify for it. And then um, we're also working with the Spanish-speaking churches in the area, trying mm -hmm. to do a little bit better outreach to the Spanish-speaking churches. C can this funding be used for someone who is um, just on the street without yes. any connection to BUS BUSD, without yep, children? absolutely. Have, yep. you, have you served any of yep. those? we have. Okay. Yep, we've housed five directly from the street to housing. 
um, with this with this funding that we have. The other funding that we have also works like towards this, so sometimes we partner them together. Oftentimes we can use this funding for a move in. We use the other money for furniture, like a bed or um, mm -hmm. a couch or something like that for our homeless neighbors. Um, right now we have 12, no, we have nine, sorry, Ashley also manages this program as well, so that's why I'm looking at her. We have nine people that are um, Bellflower residents right now on the streets with Section 8 vouchers. So we're doing a deep, deep look to try and find units for those neighbors, prioritizing them for these funds as well. So yes, these absolutely are funds that we use for our homeless neighbors. Okay, so I, I guess my, my question, my other question here is, how do you reconcile, um, so there's a new funding for rapid rehousing, and yet we have people on the street. How do you? How do you reconcile this? Say that, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't. So you have question. excess money. You uh -huh. said you only serve less than the goal, mm -hmm. and yet we have people on the street. Yeah, so it's hard to find. So how do you reconcile that? Yeah. Okay, help, help us, help us here. Yeah, so it's hard to find units um, in the area that will take our neighbors as well. So we're trying to do a lot of landlord engagement um, to try and so see if So you say hard to find units on the street. They're not... L Landlords that are willing to work with neighbors that, oh, I see. Okay. that appear I see. to be homeless. Okay. okay. Um, so there's a stigma that comes when we show up with our neighbors that are there, even if we're able to get them showers and whatever we can. So it's hard to find units oftentimes for these neighbors to get them moved in. That's one of the things. I think the, the other thing with the unused funds, um, I'm uncomfortable leaving any funding on the table, but this is funding that we have tried desperately to spend down because we want to prevent as many of our neighbors from falling into homelessness and we want mm -hmm. to anybody who's eligible we want them off the streets it costs a lot of money to get somebody off the streets because if they have a, a long-term voucher to help with their ongoing or let's say they're able to work they're still i mean what's a, a move in you you have the highest deposit possible mm -hmm. if you're a landlord you're going to ask for like the max deposit especially if they feel like they're taking a risk um so it's a high cost so I think that's when we can, we definitely use those. Um, but yeah, we would love to see more of that money spent. It's not for lack of effort. I think part of it is just the restrictions for who this can serve. So when you say lack of units, it's, that's in the city of Bellflower? Anywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Okay. We have 21 neighbors um, between Bellflower and our surrounding cities that have vouchers that can move in right away. It's, it's a it's a landlord's market right now. So people who historically in the past would maybe rent to Section 8, there's no incentive for them right now. They, mm -hmm. could, they could ask for much more, and the market says that's okay. So we're kind of competing against a lot of... Uh, okay, all right, uh, very good. Yeah. Before we move on to uh, Good Soil, do you have any question on rapid rehousing? I, I have... Good, Mayor Pro Tem Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I just have um, just a couple follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the preventive measures that you're taking that we're talking about, um, which I think are absolutely crucial, I, I, I don't disagree, and the, um, the COG and the loss of referrals that, you're, that you uh, referenced before, just to clarify, uh, these are, for again, the preventive and the, and the COG and the loss of referrals, are we talking about Bellflower residents or are we talking about area residents when you <laughs> are referencing that? COG and loss of funding? Uh, uh, the referrals. You, 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 uh, yeah, for those funding, it's we, we serve eight cities correct. with those, that funding. Actually, with the COG funding, we serve eight. Correct. With loss of funding, we serve five. But only Bellflower and Norwalk are we contracted with to do prevention programs. Okay. So all the other ones, we're doing street outreach and, and housing placement with homeless neighbors in those cities. Does that answer that question? It, it does. It okay. does. I just wanted to... I, uh, not to be parochial, but I, I mean, obviously my interest is Bellflower. So yep. I just want to ensure that. Yep. So yep. That's, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Any questions? I'm sure you have questions. No, no, no. I really? I have a comment. Oh, I mean, oh comment. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to say that the, that, that the Kingdom Causes staff is, is working really hard on, on the matters that uh, have come forth uh, you know, to the forefront in, in, in this community. And uh, uh, I know that it's, it's you know, it still takes a lot of funding, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of more, you know, a lot of more contacting and, and really connecting with, uh, with the landlords out there, as mentioned. So it's it's it, it's tough, and, and we see that, and, and we're trying to to look at every uh, option, and and the board's keeping them on task. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Okay, thank you. I got okay, a oh god, doesn't mm -hmm. remember. So uh, go ahead. What is uh, your income stream for the activities that you just described? How many 
thousands of dollars a year come in from the different sources. I know Belfair is just a small portion, but you mentioned S specific uh, to housing or our yeah, entire housing, budget. Yeah, because I know you do the uh, good soil stuff, which is a separate entity. Yeah, no, we're all one entity. All right, so yeah, if, yeah. You do, if you throw it all together. So our total budget is about 1.4 million. I would say about 800 of that is uh, related to our housing programs. Okay. Um, and then the Bellflower specific is 162 for the housing. Um, we're able to leverage our, our COG funding just got decreased this year and we've received word that it will probably decrease next year overall. Um, and so that's about anywhere from 90 to 120,000. Um, and that's targeted towards just whatever it takes to to house people who are on the streets in our cities um, that it's not that's not covered by other grants and then through path we are subcontract subcontracted with LASA and that primarily funds staffing though so this is a unique thing that we see which is also why the LMI funds are so critical we're seeing um, an increase in the willingness to cover some staff time but the pockets to actually to pay for the move-ins are decreasing and so we're, we're currently um, negotiating with the different funding entities to make sure that the goals, the numbers of households that were required to fund across all of our programs, there's actual budget to like cover the cost of move-ins, real, realizing that an average move-in is at least two to three thousand dollars. So how many staff do you have currently? So with um, including good soil, are you talking, so the housing program is eight. The housing program, because I know the good yeah. soil thing is kind of very. Yeah, so we have Kingdom Causes total, including good soil, is uh, 23 employees. Um, we have eight on the housing team, and then we have some supportive admin team, and then we have good soil, which is Jason, and then the other guys. But do you have eight full-time staff in your office? Um, for housing-wise, we have seven full-time and one um, part-time. I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so they're split up into... Um, uh, my role as a director, we have a housing navigator who is the primary one looking for the units and uh -huh. con working with landlords. We have two outreach case managers, and then we have two retention and prevention case managers, of which Ashley is one of those. And then we have a data um, data specialist to help us with all the data that we have to do. I notice your hours of operation are, uh, I think you're closed Mondays, right? No, what day you're closed? Fridays? Fridays. Fridays. For appointment only, but we're right. working, yeah. Right, so uh, Mondays it's uh, 9 to 12? Mondays, so we're open 9 to 5. 9 uh, to 5, but you have you close from 12 to close, 1 for lunch. So we close no? the community center up front just so nobody, um, and that allows our staff the time to do the required meetings and uh -huh. paperwork. Um, and then those are open by appointment, but then other than that, it's pretty much open throughout the week. We close for lunch. And then Fridays are by appointment, but Fridays we have legal aid and we have um, sometimes a representative from Whole Child that has appointments that are going on. So how many hours a week do you think your office is open? I mean, uh, uh, during the week, how many hours? Open are you? to like our, our community center Correct. being open. Yeah. Um, do the math. So that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then half day Monday. I calculated 21 hours. Does that sound right? Six hours? Because this isn't. You go uh, 9 to 12, that's three hours, an hour for lunch, and then you come back at 1, and then you go back, come back till 4. Mm -hmm. So that's three hours in the afternoon, three mm -hmm. hours in the morning, correct? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but just because you're offering those hours that you're still inside working to try to place people. Inside and outside. Yeah. Yeah. And our team yeah. also works, yeah, so some, it's, it's beyond the 9 to 5, we flex our schedules. Um, part of the intention with, like, we're not a drop-in center. Um, so the we're, while we're open as a resource center to the community, we're not like specifically a drop-in center or an access center. So our homeless neighbors that are coming there, like they need to be there for a specific purpose. Um, so if they're coming to meet with their case manager and things like that, when we had our office open um, nine to five, there's security. Which was the old model, wasn't it? The old it? model, but there's security issues of if we didn't have like a couple staff there and if there wasn't the people there to answer the questions of people coming in, it just wasn't sustainable. Honestly, for the amount of funding that we get to cover the staffing, it's we can't sustain it. I see. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Now, can you tell us about the good story about uh, good, good soils? Soil. So yeah, let me tell you guys some of the trends from good soil. Um, this last year, we decided to take um, a focus on some of our homeless neighbors, which in the past we have hired some that are homeless, but we have three who are currently homeless. Um, which means that we're actually keeping them on our staff a little bit longer because the goal is to use Good Soil Industries, the employment part, mm -hmm. to provide people that like 
that first job experience where we know that they are employable, but they really need to work on their soft skills of showing up on time, learning how to work under a manager. Um, and so we target three to six months in general, but with some of our homeless neighbors, we've kept them on for longer. As we're looking for some of their housing, um, like their housing stability plans and trying to get them plugged into housing as well. Uh, but in general, we hire about 20 guys a year. Um, most of them are from Bellflower, um, although I think our requirement is that ten, at least 10 of those are from Bellflower, but we, we target Bellflower specifically. We have been um, coordinating a lot with Celico. Um, we are exploring becoming a portal partner site for CalJobs where we could actually um, set up appointments directly with the caseworkers there mm -hmm. to get them coordinated with the state funds and the state, um, the state system for uh, CalJobs. Um, and then we also do the case management and the life skills classes. So I think something that's unique when you think about Good Soil, um, we are one, we're the only certified social enterprise in this corner of LA County. So there's a lot of great social enterprises that are intended for creating jobs for hard to hire populations. Um, we are the only one out here. So we have a permanent waiting list. Um, so we're always looking to expand, um, but it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work because we're running a business and we're trying to ensure that this work experience gets our guys on a trajectory of um, self-sufficiency. So you have a waiting list of participants? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep, we do. So we'd love to grow. So how can you expand the program? Um, so we are talking, I can't talk about exactly who, but we're talking with some large local entities um, about uh, in expanding some contracts, which could create more hours and create more jobs. Mm -hmm. Do you need another Jason? We do need another Jason. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think that's part of the problem is Jason is doing full, two full-time jobs. He's running a business that is impossible to be profitable because we intentionally hire people that nobody else would hire and train them, which means broken equipment. It means a lot of like a lot of coaching and mentoring. Um, so running the business with 100 customers. And then the other side is he's trying to walk along these guys. And we have support from the team. And that's why like partnering with Celico and other, mm. other groups is very like needed and important um, to provide that case management to as they get that next job to help make sure that they like stay in that employment, stay in their housing. Do you still have a? Do you also have a a, sh um, a waiting list of customers to be served? Like, so um, we we actually had to we had um, a con a group called Rediff, which is um, a social enterprise. Um, they're a nonprofit, I guess. They're a foundation. Um, they did some work with us in um, streamlining our business model because we were losing a lot of money. They helped us figure out which customers are too far to drive out to um, and which ones, what are the ideal customers so we could actually like make money on on the property. So we, for, we cut back and now we have a very like, um, we know the type of customer and the type of job that we could do well and that would actually be profitable. Um, I think a lot of people have the misunderstanding that because we have a social social enterprise that that makes enough money to mm -hmm. fundraise for the rest of the organization. The truth is that we have to fundraise about 90,000 in addition to the funding that you guys provide us to cover the full cost of what it takes to run yes. the program. Okay. But that sounds bad sometimes people are like, well that's not very efficient, but when you think about if this was just a jobs program and you didn't have an income an earned income stream, that would be an additional 170,000 that we'd be having to fundraise to do this cool program. Okay. So we've had um, over 200 guys graduate now. Over, over how many years? Over 10 years. 10 years. Okay, yeah. that's good. Good yeah. track record. Okay. Yeah. One of them's are um, on our board now. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Any question? Of Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem Garza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick comment. I was able to sit down with Kingdom Causes, I think it was like seven months ago, maybe six months ago yeah. when I went to visit. Uh, Mr. Hockman yeah. and I went over there and um, I think we spent like a good hour and a half mm -hmm. with you and kind of got to know Kingdom Causes 101, mm -hmm. everything from the prevention to the outreach to uh, the receptionist in the front to um, good soil so to everyone. So um, I just want to thank you for that. It really opened up my eyes in terms of how your organization is managed and runs and the challenges you're encountering. and. One of the things I didn't know was how the um, your participants in Good Soils, you know, are there's a fixed time that they're in that program, right? Mm -hmm. So you're kind of you're kind of running against the clock to try to 
I don't want to say reform, but assist somebody and get them to have good quality of life skills before they have to move on. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, so I just want to commend you for, for all you do in that, in that program. I, I really learned a lot when I sat down with you and, and took the time to, to learn. So I just wanted to thank you thank for all you, you do. Yeah. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Dunn? I'm good. You okay. did a wonderful job. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Coops? No. And I Hamada? compliment you. I mean, you're part of our community. You live here, you work here, you breathe here, you have babies here. <laughs> you do it all here. <laughs> You're part of us, and we really appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes, I'd like to echo that. But, uh, Chrissy, uh, you might want to highlight that. I mean, there's a large company that, that you know has the confidence in good mm-hmm. soil that they actually do yeah. the lawns. for. Yeah, we, we do Kaiser Permanente, right, right. two of their big office buildings in Downey, which is a full day of work. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I think just to sum up, we really, at Kingdom Causes, um, our kingdom causes bellflower. Our our hope is to never um, give a handout. Like we really, we, that's why the job piece I think is in, as critical as the housing piece. Like we really want to s- give the dignity of work and help people get back on their feet and be self sufficient. Because not only because fiscally that's smart. Um, you should see the the change in their mm-hmm. countenance when they earn their first paycheck. There's a change in them. And so yeah. that's something we, we never want to see go away. Yeah. Okay. So Very thank good. You. All right. Thank you so much for your report and um, please come back again. Thanks. All right. With that, I'd like to make a motion to um, adopt 14J and 14K of the consent calendar. Second. Um, motion by the mayor, uh, seconded by Mayor Potem Garza to adapt 14J and 14K of the consent calendar. Roll call, please. Councilmember Hamada? Aye. Councilmember Coops? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Garza? Aye. Councilmember Dutton? Aye. Mayor Santanis? Aye. All right, council reports. Councilmember Hamada? So, uh, quickly here, uh, again, I enjoyed uh, the grand opening of uh, Steel Graph with my colleagues there. Uh, great opening and uh, definitely wanna uh, send out Big kudos to Kim and uh, Martin for getting the job done and, and uh, starting it up. Um, uh, let's see, on the 15th, I, I was able to uh, stop in at the closing ceremonies of the Greater Belfort Little League uh, and uh, just want to congratulate the, the kids and the coaches and the parents for having a great season. And um, this uh, past, uh, uh, last Monday, I did uh, sit in on the Living with Coyotes uh, presentation, and uh, uh, it was quite interesting. Um, and I uh, want to thank Dr. Quinn for the presentation and the uh, staff from the Department of Fish and Game and and Siaka. And um, uh, when uh, when somebody says coyote scat, uh, you're not trying to shoot away. Just watch what you step. So it's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, um, that's what I learned out of it. No, uh, and then uh, this past Saturday, I um, uh, was with the mayor and Mr. Coops uh, at the Relay for Life uh, opening ceremonies. Uh, again, uh, again, a uh, nice event. Uh, and uh, uh, with time, hopefully, it'll get back to its heyday. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, I think you have to adjourn. Oh, I get to do that too. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's all in one there. Yes. That we were going to announce. It's your right. opportunity um, now. Okay. Joseph A. Perry. Um, look at um, Mr. Perry, former let's say, assistant superintendent of educational services for the Belfort Unified School District, passed away uh, this uh, uh, June 4, 2019. Um, I, I did know Joe and uh, worked with Joe on a number of projects, not only at the schools, but also within the community. And um, look at Joe started his career with the Belfort Unified in September of, of 1982, started as an elementary school teacher at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and then he also worked at the adult school. In 1994, Joe um, took on the role as summer school principal and began the new school year as a child welfare and also the attendance officer at the district office. Then in 96, he was named principal at the, at the newly reopened Albert Baxter Elementary School. Um, during his years at Baxter, his school received the California Distinguished School Recognition. Uh, then in 98, uh, Joe was once again given the task of opening a new school as the principal of the ILC, the Intensive Learning Center. Um, 
Joe continued uh, his accomplishments uh, with uh, being principal at Mayfair High School from 2000 to 2006. And then in, in uh, 2006, he moved on to Belfort High School, became the principal there for another six years. So um, right after uh, that, uh, in 2012, Joe served in his final role at the district as the, su as, as the assistant superintendent of the educational services. After 33 years of dedicated service to the Belfort community, uh, Joe retired in June of 2015. Uh, Joe left a mark on the Belfort Unified School District and, and uh, this city through as many uh, lives that he touched uh, uh, through the course of his career. Uh, uh, some people said Joe was a tough guy to work with, but Joe cared about the kids and uh, that was his priority. And uh, he, uh, uh, he did an awesome job within this district. Um, Joe is survived by his wife, Ellen, and he also had a son. So um, we extend our deepest sympathies and heartfelt condolences out to the entire Parrott family. Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Hamada. Council Member Coops. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to talk a little bit about the Relay for Life and where uh, the mayor and Mr. Hamada and myself were there and our new Senator Bob Archuleta was there. And you know, he's all about the vets. And so here was an opportunity to talk to him about the plans we have to improve our library garden over here with a veterans memorial. So I put him on alert that we're gonna be looking for some assistance on what we're doing over there. And he was game. So just, I don't wanna forget about that conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, I explained to him that we have a current council member who's a veteran, and this is near and dear to all of us, but he's gonna make making phone calls to you too. And, uh, but I didn't want him to be blindsided with just a letter, we need some funding. So we have a place, we have an intent, but after we had the wall here, it moved us in such a way that we need some permanency to the honor the veterans of our town. And he was all in, so just side note. Anyway, um, gonna uh, also uh, memorialize this evening uh, for a friend of mine who passed away last week, Philip Hickok. Philip Hickok, a judge of the Los, An Los Angeles Superior Court, passed away June 18th, 2019 at the age of 72. Judge Hickok was a distant relative of the historic figure, while Bill Hickok, a lawman and gunfighter in the Old West. Uh, Phil attended UCLA for both his undergraduate and law degrees. Prior to his appointment as a judge, Judge Hickok served as a deputy county counsel from 1972 to 1989, and he served as vice president of the County Council Association from 1983 and 1987. He was appointed to the bench by Governor George Duke Majin in 1989 and served until his retirement in 2013. He served in the Long Beach, Compton, and Norwalk courthouses. While in Norwalk, he was a supervising judge of the Southeast District in the late 1990s. Among his assignments were he advised the registrar recorder, medical examiner, and was noted by former Los Angeles County Counsel Lloyd Pellman as being an even-tempered analytical attorney on the staff. Judge Hickok, on a personal note, administered myself my oath of office in 2009 and again in 2013. The story is, is that I uh, went to church with Phil for 40 years, and uh, he was a member of the Optimist Club in, Arte in Cerritos, as was Don Canabi. So uh, Don Canabi and Phil Hickok and myself, one of our jobs is we took offering together for many years at our church, and that's why I got to know these guys back in the, in the early 70s. So. Uh, Phil has always been a part of my life. He's just a genuinely nice man, uh, very organized, and uh, always there to help you on an illegal legal question that he had. Uh, the uh, sympathies, of course, are going to his wife and his daughter. But uh, the actual Beth Bethany Christian Reformed Church will be hosting the services, and that will be held Thursday, June 27 at 11 o'clock in the morning. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Groups. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I I had the honor of serving with Mr. Hickok on, on, the, uh, on the board of pa Pathways Volunteer Hospice and um, a very fine man. I looked up to him in the short time I knew him, so and thank you, you're adjourned his honor. Um, just to piggyback on the Steelcraft uh, grand opening, great event, um, and I think uh, my colleague said uh, pretty much everything in terms of how great that event was. I absolutely want to make sure that, that I thank Howard TDM and the whole team there for really designing and putting on a really good project. That's a, I think a, a game changer for our city. Um, I especially wanna thank two people that are here in this room right now.
first of all, I want to thank Mr. Jim Delalonga, our director of economic development, um, because he is the first person that actually uh, brought this to our city. So I absolutely, if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't be here. So I want to thank him for everything. Um, to those of you that, that have seen the uh, downtown Bellflower uh, floor stickers that you see throughout our downtown right now, that's Mr. Delalonga. So he's doing an absolutely great job in trying to promote our downtown and lastly, I want to thank Ms. our city manager, Jeff Stewart, for all his work and support with that project. Um, as you can imagine, when you have a project of that scale that is something unique and new, um, it's not uncommon to have some natural resistance built into it. And the fact that these two gentlemen navigated this project that in hindsight, we can't even imagine not being here um, is really a testament to, to their hard work and, and, and their transformation. So I want to thank them for, for all their hard work. Um, I also attended on the 13th, that, that same evening, um, the Bellflower Teachers Association had a, uh, I think it was their first time uh, retirement dinner, which is, was a dinner that they hosted for teachers and members of the Bellflower Unified School District that were retiring. Um, the whole school board was there. I was there. Uh, it was really fascinating to hear all the stories uh, of that I think uh, probably Mr. Coops um, and Mr. Dutton could relate to that I can, unfortunately, but you know, of, of the old days in Bellflower and the school system. I mean, these are the teachers that, that have been teaching in our, in our community for decades, right? And to be able to hear that, those stories and gain an appreciation was really, uh, was really satisfying in a great way, especially being married to a teacher. So um, that was a great event. On the 14th, the following day, um, I, as a member of the League of Cities Revenue and Taxation Committee, I traveled to Sacramento to attend our quarterly meeting um, we actually had a, the new government affairs representative for uh, CalPERS that was there. Um, she is also a council member from the city of Palm Springs. And it is one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever heard regarding CalPERS, which when you start talking actuarial and all these numbers, you start getting these glazed looks naturally. So, uh, but it was a fantastic presentation and I'm actually gonna be trying to get her to come and present um, to us and to League of Cities as well. Um, I think the what she one two things that I took away from what she shared with us is that CalPERS has admitted past mistakes in terms of their um, their increased benefits that they did with public safety and the impact that it's had on cities today. And then the second thing is regarding the um, the divestiture that CalPERS is taken upon, which is um, they're starting to the board is starting to lean away from having social investments and actually doing more uh, black and white, you know, uh, profit-based investments. Um, that's that's the, the feature they're going on. So it was refreshing to hear that conversation. And lastly, we had a presentation from Treasurer, State Treasurer Ma and some of the programs that she's undertaking. Um, on the 18th, uh, starting on the 18th, it was last week, uh, Wednesday through Friday, I was, I attended the League of Cities Mayors and Council Members Executive Forum and Advanced Leadership. Um, I was also sharing with our city manager before, it's my favorite conference that I attend and we attend some really good conferences. Um, I especially like this because it's all council members and only council members that attend this. And so you have really uh, um, peer-based conversations that happen. So some of the things that I, I really uh, learned a lot about were opportunity zones. Um, unfortunately, we don't have one of those in our city. I'm hoping that Congress would change that in the future because I think it would be very beneficial to our community. Um, we also talked about innovation in the public sector, um, uh, the public sector engaging in social media, homelessness, um, also communication between councils and also between council and our staff. And then lastly, really uh, interesting was uh, the city of Malibu had a presentation regarding the fires that they had uh, last uh, November. Um, and uh, I have a quote that I, I like using a lot. Um, and the quote from Mike Tyson is, everyone has a plan till you get punched in the face, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so Malibu had all these plans, you know, obviously they're nestled uh, over there and they had all these exit plans for if they ever encountered a disaster, how things were gonna flow. And what they found with this fire was that all those plans basically got punched in the face and um, so it was really sobering to hear the stories. Unfortunately, nobody, you know, uh, uh, died in that. But um, there's a lot of uh, room for, for, uh, 
for, for learning there. And so it was, I think that that's one of those examples that we're going to be, a city officials going to be learning more, especially living in a, in an area that's prone to earthquakes. Um, so I learned about that. Lastly, um, uh, CJ Nord and her neighborhood watch group, uh, this past Saturday invited, uh, me to do a presentation regarding their, uh, during their meeting. Um, they had around 20 people. There's a lot of Q and a regarding what's going on in the city. Um, they asked about homelessness, a lot, about, a lot of the developments throughout the city, but um, it was a really nice uh, conversation. So I thank her and her group for inviting me to uh, having given um, a council member perspective on what's going on in our city. So, and that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Portem Garza. Council Member Dunn. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Well, as we're coming up on the 4th of July, we all know every year we have trouble with the illegal fireworks. And I want to uh, make it. Uh, known that there's a two thousand dollar fine uh, a citation for every violation that an individual gets caught um, so i'd like to ask the community and their help because there's no way that the sheriff department can police the whole situation as we know as as previous fourth of july's over the last decade it's escalated into a i like to say a war zone um, i work firework stand duty till 11 o'clock at night and when we pack up and leave it's the whole sky is lit up there's nothing but smoke it's a, it's a mess and i would like to ask the community if you see something something say something um not just on the fourth it's going on now it's going to go continue now and it may be even now for the fourth but uh my uh best advice is to call the bellflower substation between the hours of eight and five and then after that the sheriff department and uh during the daytime when it's occurring, um, the substation has a better access to some people to get to the site. And then if you do call, try to get as close to it possible as an address that they can where it's going on. Um, that's my advice for the community until it's now. Uh, um, it's a lot of, it's really annoying for pets. It's really annoying for people that have to listen to it. Um, but it's something we have to deal with as a community. And, and on July 5th, as, as, a, as, a, as a Bellflower Council person, we get really beat up over it. Um, and it's that way every year. But uh, we're trying to think outside the box to try to do something. And uh, we're going to keep trying until it gets better. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, uh, Council Member Dunn. Um, just a few things here. I just want to piggyback on Steelcraft. Uh, I think we're just. It's a combination of um, we have the right tools, we have the right staff to make it happen. And um, uh, I know that Steelcraft also building another location, another location. And uh, mind you that they started before Bellflower, but we finished ahead of them. And that's because of the staff. When I talked to the developer, Martin Howard, uh, he admitted that um, our staff is very easy to work with. So, and that's a testament to the quality of our staff led by our city manager. And secondly, also, is that um, we happen to have a great location for them, and the price of the property was very uh, appealing to them. Because I know there's another, also another city trying to get them in, but they could not offer what we could offer to, to Steelcraft. So, uh, kudos to Steelcraft and our staff for making this happen. It's a, it's a great addition. If you have not been to Steelcraft, Please try it. It's a different environment, different atmosphere. It's just very different from any place that I have been to. Uh, secondly, also, um, last week, um, Rowena Ginello and I, our planning, direct, planning manager, attended a uh, presentation on the census, which is upcoming next, uh, next year in 2020. I just want to alert our citizens, our residents, to please be on the lookout because we want you to be counted. Everyone, everyone needs to be counted because there's so much at stake. We were given the number of $2,000 per person that's undercounted. And if you extrapolate that, that um, the census only undertaken every 10 years. So if 100 persons were not counted in one year, we lost $2,000 per person that year, times 100, times 10 years, because the next census is going to be in 2030. So that's the amount of money that we could potentially lose. So please respond to the census. It's really important so that we get our fair share from the government. Uh, also for Relay of Life, and again, again, I want to thank the, the organizers for a very successful event. Um, 
I also went to the grand opening plus the luminaria. It was just kind of, uh, it kind of reminds you of how fortunate we are. We have a lot of survivors in Bellflower and all surrounding area, and they're just really fighters. They really want to fight, and they, a lot of them are successful. And that, that evening, on the Saturday evening, we honored those who were not able to survive um, cancer. Uh, and I just want to kind of uh, piggyback on the fireworks issue. First of all, I want to thank staff for arranging to have those reader boards uh, on four um, main thoroughfare, Artesia, uh, Rosecrans, and Alondra plus Clark. So you'll see some flashing signals reminding of the, the fines for illegal fireworks. And finally, I just want to remind everyone that if you hear, if you see any fireworks, right now they are illegal okay because of the timing they can only be legal fireworks can only be lighted only three or four days but right now they are even legal fireworks are illegal today okay if they are ignited today they are illegal so with that uh, we will adjourn this meeting in memory of joseph perry and judge phil haycock to the next regular meeting of the Belfar city council at 5.30 p.m. on Monday, July 8, 2019, uh, this meeting is adjourned.